All right, folks. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are we doing tonight? Coach Michael Burt, I hope you guys are doing great. Uh, we have over 250 people that have registered for tonight's uh, webinar, free webinar with me and Dr. Kevin Elko. And man, we're excited about having you here. And uh, if you've ever said to yourself, man, I want to be tougher mentally. Man, I, I'm tough enough to get, uh, I'm tough enough to get what I have, but I'm not tough enough to get what I want. Uh, then I think tonight's going to be good for you. This is gearing up for a four week series that Dr. Elko and I are going to be doing uh, in the month of July on called Battle Tested. And uh, so I, I, I thought with Dr. Elko and I, we would come together tonight to give you a preview of what we're going to be covering that four week course. We expect three to 500 people to be in that course. We hope many of you decide to take us up on that because if you could be coached by a 30 times national championship coach, same coach as coaching the Alabama Crimson Tide uh, and many, many others, then why wouldn't you do it, man? If you said to me, coach, what's the one thing missing today from most people out there in the world, it is mental toughness. It is the ability to bounce back from adversity. It is the ability to have self-talk. It's the ability to take an idea and see it through to its logical conclusion. So tonight I'm excited because we're going to break down. I got a whole host of questions. If you have questions for me or Dr. Elko, then please post those questions in the chat box and we'll try to get to those uh, in our 45 minute to one hour deal. But tonight's about mindset, mental hacks of top producers. How do the top people in the world prepare? How do they respond? How do they work through their day? And uh, like I said, so I'm really excited. So Dr. Elko, I think I saw you on here. I'm uh, on here. There he is. How you doing champ? I'm doing real good. Well, we got, a, we got a whole group of, uh, I think we had almost 300 people register for tonight. And uh, many of these people are in our coaching programs and are some of those people follow you throughout the, the world. And I wanted to start tonight by, by just giving some context because I think you making a decision early in life to be a sports psychologist, go back, go back to the very beginning and just give some context to these folks of when you made a decision, we know where you're at today, 30 time national championship performance coach, uh, Crimson Tide, a whole host of other people that you can go into. But for a lot of these people on here tonight, man, they're trying to find their voice in life. And uh, I went back and watched some of your previous story of when you made a decision to go into the field and then made a decision to really go do it at the highest level with the NFL players. So go back and give some context to your journey of ended up where you are today. Well, I was um, undergraduate. I lived at home, just trying to go through school, worked, played football, worked in a grocery store, trying to pay my way through. And I was want to be a coach. My undergraduate degree is in biology and coaching. I literally have a bachelor's degree in coaching. And I was going to write this paper on exercise physiology. And as I went through that section, I saw this book. It was by a guy named Tutko called The Psychology of Coaching. I picked this up, Coach, on a uh, Friday night. No, Friday afternoon, about 2 o'clock. Friday night, I'm still reading. I couldn't put it down. It just grabbed. I didn't grab it. It grabbed me. It grabbed me. And that's how it is. You just find your gift and it grabbed me. I stayed with that. I came home. And, you know, I said to my dad, my, my dad worked on the railroad. He'd go three or four days. He came out, I go, I'm going to be a sports psychologist for the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Dallas Cowboys, the United States Olympic Committee. He goes, what is it? What is a sports psychologist? I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> but there, you said one word. I'm trained to listen to what people say. You said one word three times. Decide. Yeah. And it, it, it was a decision. And then I spoke it. And before my father passed away, he reminded me that I said those things and they all manifest. Mm -hmm. You know, IBM, I imagine, believe, manifest. And I did it with faith. I didn't know what I was saying. I spoke and all this. I ended up being a sports psychologist for all three of those places. And it was that day I put down that book and it just lit me up. And like I said, it grabbed me. I've loved the topic. I've loved the whole idea of performance. Went on and got my bachelor's and master's and a couple master's and so forth at West Virginia. And the rest is just kind of the way my life went. And I just loved it, loved it. And, you know, then decided really 
that I want to go on the top level. I did that, but I also just really became passionate. See, when I played ball, I constantly watched tape of me and other guys. So now I watch tape. You know, I'll, I'll be traveling. I'll be traveling to Memphis uh, coming up. I'm going to Kentucky tomorrow. But all my time, I watch tape of other speakers, of myself, of other people. I watch tape, and I just I work hard on on what I'm trying to do. So that's when it all happened. That's all when that occurred. Tell me about you. Tell me about when you made a decision. I know you're a championship coach. I know what you did. But when did you make your decision to be a coach and to come out here and help the world? 15 years old, a little league baseball coach who was one of my baseball coaches picked up the phone and called me and asked me to help him coach a junior pro basketball team. And uh, thank goodness I said yes, man. Because the minute I said yes, I started coaching those kids. I knew that's what I was supposed to do. You know. But the challenge is you have to decide a number of times and right. you have to do it over and over and over when it, when, when it's written, it's 70 times seven. That means sometimes you got to do it 490 times. Tell them the story that I love about the teacher said, coach Bert, I think you have, or uh, Mr. Bert, I think you have a lot of talent. I don't think I'm getting to you. Tell me how I can get to you better. Cause it seems to me like you made a decision a couple of times. And our people need to know that you don't make a decision once. You got to keep on making it until you convince the world something bigger than you. But tell them about that deal with that teacher. Say, wait a minute. I don't think I'm getting you. How can I, how can I get, get to you? And I see you, Mark, you old WVU grad. Come on, man. I, hey, before we're done, you know what I sing at the end? Country road. But tell them about that. Tell them about that teacher that did that to you. Yeah, this is really a leadership lesson about, about making a decision over and over. I, I went to college for nine years to, uh, to pursue three degrees, and I, and I remember very, very few of my college professors. I was in a geology class or something similar in my undergraduate, and I sat on the back row. I wore a baseball hat. I didn't have any confidence. I didn't want to talk to people. I was scared to talk to people. You guys can imagine that. And, uh, and so I sit in the back, and I was a very average student at the end of that class one day my professor came up to me and said Mr. Burt can I walk you to your next class and I said you want to walk me to my next class I never talked to the woman I never spent a lot of time with the woman she said yeah I, I, I would like to walk you to your next class no professor had ever done that and on my way to class she just talked to me and she said Mr. Burt I see a lot of potential in you what can I do to be a better professor to help you reach that potential and when she took an interest in me I moved from the back of the class to the front of the class. I went from being one of the worst students to one of the best students. And it taught me a very valuable lesson that I carried with me to being a basketball coach is that every day after class, I would pick a player and I would say, let's go down to the football stadium and let's take a walk with each other. We walk around the football stadium and I would say, how you doing? How's your boyfriend? How's your parents? How's your classes? And then I would ask a very important question. I would say, uh, what can I do? to be a better basketball coach so you can reach your potential. And that one question changed the nature of our relationship. When I took an interest in the kid, when I talked to them the same way that professor did with me, and when she said those magic words to me is I see some potential in you, how do I be a better leader to get that potential out of you? And that's really, that, that really changed the way I live because no other professor did that, Dr. Elko. In nine years of college, three, three, almost 400 hours of college credit, no professor ever said, man, I see something in you. How do we help you manifest that potential? And that was a game changer for me. See, seven times 70, you got to decide over and over and over, you know, and you got to keep on doing it and decide because every time you make the decision, it goes deeper. You make that mark deeper. And, you know, everything we build a Crimson Tide on is energy, not a feeling. It's a choice. You decide it. Greatness, it's a choice. Everything's a choice. And the wonderful thing you talked about, since I met you, you know what I say? I pull my kids aside, say, Jared, come here, dog. It's my son. He's over in another room. How, how can I help you as a parent to be a better you? My daughter just called me from, she's working at Deloitte out in LA. Hey, and so I do it with my own kids, but we got to understand that when we connect like that, I say this, I've been with a lot of coaches. Saban, man's wild, but he keeps three chairs outside his office and there, there's always a player in there, one-on-one -on -one connection, connection to the ball game. So to your first question, Watch your first question. It comes down. All greatness starts with this word. Ready? Decide. Come on, I got some mountaineers on here, so I got to bring it. You know, and I'll be, I see you, Kentucky. I'll be in Pikesville tomorrow. You got to get to a point where you're saying, I decided. So 
you know what? Can I tell you, Coach Bird, I decided this from now on. You know what's my favorite day? Today. I decided it's my favorite day. It's today. It's everything in life's decision. So you got to decide what you're going to do. That's the first thing. I got to decide it. Here comes the second part. Ready? My friend, some of these guys were on my inner call. They heard me say this earlier. My friends, Father's Day, you call friends and some of them lost their dad. Coach, did you know love has a price? Mm -hmm. It's called a broken heart. Mm. It, 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 it's called a broken heart. Everything has a price. After you make the decision, then you got to pay the price. I'll ask everybody on this call. Have any of you ever, in, are you investing in yourself? Are you paying the price? Are you getting better? That's the second part. And then you got to pay. I could say I got to, I'm going to go to these places, but I had to go get my doctorate, had to read the books, had to walk in and know what I'm doing. You know, you're going to go and you're going to hold court with Nick Saban. You're going to go and hold court with Bill Cower. You're going to go with Andy Reid. I think you better do your homework before you go in there. Don't walk in there a piker. Even though I'm going to Pikesville, Kentucky, don't walk in there. You can walk in and say, look, I'm ready for this. I got ready for this. And so the second part is, you know, old Jim Rowan, work harder on yourself. You do that job. Yeah. And so after you make the, make the decision, then you got to do the work. And well, you got to go be better. Let's, let's talk about this, because I think a lot of these people that are on the call tonight have uh, about 50 percent of the people that come to me have a desire to coach. They, they coach in some capacity. They want to they want to do something. You have worked with some of the best coaches in the world. And it, it, tell speak a little bit about what they're looking for. Are they looking for a competitive advantage? Are they looking for mental toughness when they bring you in? Because I'm a big believer. Everybody needs a coach in life. Who's coaching you matters, man. Who's coaching you matters. The better the coach, the better the team. Okay. And, and when you think about battle tested and why these coaches bring you in to help them perform at a higher level, what are they really looking? What are they really looking for when they bring you in? I don't fit all coaches. I, I don't fit all coaches and people don't realize what the savings of the world are about. You get your motivation different ways. There's, there's something called deficiency motivation. I need to dominate you. You can do greatness. I, I don't have mentioned any athletes' names or some people. I'm going to dominate you. I'm going to dominate Mark. I'm going to dominate Joshua. I'm going to dominate you. And I need to be the best, better than anybody else. That is one way. The guys that bring me in, it's different. See Coach Bird over there? He's my family. I'll go through the fire for him. That's different. That's different. So what are the best coaches looking for? They're looking for a couple of things. I did this years ago with the Steelers, first of all. Are you able to have a consciousness that you raise other people up? My main guy this year, so the Eagles come to me. I'll pull out my Super Bowl ring here in a minute. I, I got an LSU ring. I, I, I saw some Baton Rouge people here. But the Eagles come to me and go, hey, tell me about Smitty, Devonnie Smith, because I'm at Bama. We did the best leadership training year ever last year because of COVID. I went in once a month, Alabama. The next week, we trained. We had one phrase. So... Land, so first of all, Smitty stands up in front of the team. After I get done doing leadership, we go right to the main team with Alabama. He goes, look, you guys start complaining when we're warming up. How would that not make us complain the whole practice? I'm going to start positive. Then he said the magic word. Are you ready? The magic phrase. Match me. Match me. Then Landon Dickerson started up. Then Landon Dickerson said, look, I played against you at Florida State Kate, and felt the intensity. Walked in here and felt the intensity. Well, you ain't intense this year. I bring intensity every day, and so are you. Match me. Then Mac Jones started up. He goes, you know what? After a mistake, I'm, I do self-pity. I'm going to now focus on a process. Match me. So here's what it is. You set the tempo. Then you say, match me. Match my intensity, match my love, match the way I finish, just match me. Hey, watch. COVID started with one person. We, we're now debating how it started. Start epidemic. Start a positive epidemic. Start, a, start an intensity epidemic. So the guys are looking for me. Watch this. I'm, this is a loaded question. Who is the best quarterback? I, I asked this to the Eagles. Who's the best quarterback? Oh, Tom Brady. No, Tom Brady's the best ball player. He ain't the best quarterback because he lifts other people. That's what they're looking for when they bring me in. It's match me. So when the Eagles came to me, they said, what do you like? You, you, what do you like Devontae Smith? Yeah, I like him. He works hard. 
He's the second best leader I've ever seen. Oh, we'll take him. Who's the best leader? Landon Dickerson. They took him too. You got to say what they're looking for in me when I bring him in. So I'll ask you this question. Tell me the best game you ever had in your life. I'll go to the NFL combines. If you say the word I, mm. I dismissed you as soon as you said I. I might be sitting there like this, but I'm thinking I dismissed this joker. He's tore up from the floor up. If one of them comes talking about we, and they talk about I decided, and they talked about the whole concept of what we want, what they're looking for is we, I decide in intensity. Match me. So really, you talk a lot about, and, and, and obviously in July, we're going to cover four weeks called Battle Tested. And, you know, I coach, you now coach people in the business world. I coach a lot of people in the business world. When I retired at 31 years old to get into the business world, the first thing I, uh, that confused me was the lack of intensity in the, in the business world. The lack of, uh, you know, they needed more intensity. The athletic world has intensity. There's a game, there's a championship. There's something in the future to work toward, right? And, and to me, I, I had one, uh, I get into the same place every year and got beat by the same person. And finally, in my sixth or seventh year, I, I decided that I was going to sit down with six coaches that had won a championship and ask them what I wasn't doing, what we were not doing. Sit down. First coach I sit down with and I said, man, uh, I, I want to win a championship. And he looked at me and said, no, you don't want to win a championship. And I said, what do you mean? I mean well, I'm tired of getting beat by the same person, get to the same level. And he said, no, you don't want to win a championship because I've looked at your schedule and you play soft teams and you get beat. Uh, excuse me, you win those games and then you parade around like you're somebody. And he said, your team is not battle tested. And because they're not battle tested, they get in big games and they don't know how to handle the pressure. Okay. And he said, here's what I want you to do. If you're serious about winning a championship, go back and schedule the best team in six different States, go all over the world, play the best people. You're going to get beat by some of those people, but, but then your team's going to be battle tested. There's no more false positive because right now you're living in false positive. You think you're really good, but you're not that good. And I've never forgotten that concept of battle tested. I see business people that have not been battle tested. I see people that have not been battle tested. Therefore, when they get under pressure, they fold. They do not know how to continue to see something through. So what does that word battle tested mean to you? Because that's the concept we're going to be covering in July. What does that mean to you to be battle tested? Israelites were not given the easiest path to the promised land because they weren't battle ready. That's what it said. They weren't battle tested. Um, I went out. I, I want to live to be 100 years old because my job is annoying my kids. And I want to be here doing my little cabbage patch dance at their wedding, you know. So I go to Cleveland Clinic and I go, I like to be around for a while. They told me, go run sprints. I do hit training. So I run 10 minutes this hill. I call this hill Big Bertha. Eight minutes up and down this hill. I drive my heart rate up to 150. Why would they tell me to do that? Because when I push my heart, my heart does what? It responds and gets stronger and better. Your spirit needs Big Bertha. Your spirit needs to be battle tested. Your spirit wants to be pushed because when we do it, we want the challenge. What Caleb say, Daddy? Give me a mountain to climb. Because when you do it, you pull from it. I flat love, you got to go see this movie, The, 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 the 12 Mighty Orphans. Oh, that movie, me and my, that set me off. This coach is out right now. Oh, it's you. This coach went down into Fort Worth, true movie, and took all these orphans. He was an orphan and told him, because you're an orphan, you ain't no throwaway. You're tougher than the rest. He convinced him. Not, you're, because you went through. So you got to say one thing, ready? If you want to get battle tested. Whatever happened didn't happen to you. It happened for you. You got to claim that once you identify and pull it out. Martin Seligman said people who came out of Vietnam who said, oh, that was awful. They labeled it as awful. It was awful. Those people who came out of Vietnam said, and they had what they call critical stress. Some people said, no, I grew from that. They had critical growth. They're rare, but they're there. You got to start looking back. And now's the time to look back at what we just went through and say, I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to grow through that. That happened for me. And so you sit back and it's called, when you look back, here's what you do to be battle tested, battle ready. You look back and you don't say, I wasn't contaminated. You have to claim it, declare it. I was redeemed. My past happened for me. And now watch this, and my future, 
That's going to happen because of me. Class dismissed. You got to look back. You got to look back. Oh, uh, yeah. No, you, you, they come that four week thing. This going to ramp up. This, this right here, this is exhibition season right here tonight. Well, you got to look back and claim it and, de and define it. That happened for me. And that's why the Israelites were giving the hardest. That's why they got me running this hill. Go run Big Bertha. I do. What is the difference? I talk a lot about going pro. And there's a significant difference to me between, you know, amateurs and professionals. And many people don't really know what that difference is in the business world. So they're operating at some frequency, Dr. Elko, and they believe that frequency is a high frequency because they've never been exposed to what it really means to be a pro at what they do and really the next level. Can you explain to the people here? Because to me, I have very clear indicators if you're a pro and if, if there's certain habits you have every day, there's certain preparations you have every day, there's certain way, cadence and rhythm of how you attack the day. What I see a lot in the business world is a lot of inconsistency. We work hard one day and then we take it easy. We prospect some and then we don't prospect some. We follow up some and we don't follow up some. What I spend a lot of time with my own personal team who's on here tonight with me is teaching them the habits of a pro. If you want to make pro money, if you want to be considered a pro, there's a significant difference in these two things. And many times, it's almost like a player coming to the collegiate level that's never played under a Saban and they really see what it's really like to play under a Saban or a player that goes from there to playing for NFL. Can you explain the variance and difference between those levels? The first thing you want to do as a pro, you have to say to yourself, I'm no longer playing on Friday nights. I want to play Sunday. It starts with a decision. Mm -hmm. And you have to say it starts all with a decision. And you have to decide that I'm going to start playing Sunday afternoons, I'm done Friday night. And it's, it, it comes decision. Then it comes with a strong vision. Now, here comes the big one, ready? The amateur goes after what they go after occasionally. They're the bottom 3%. They go after what they want to go after occasionally. The, the pro goes after it all the time. I say like this, what they're going to get in the, in the seminar. The amateur is the greyhound. They chase the rabbit because they're hungry. The lion, it hunts every day. It's in his DNA. It has nothing to do with being hungry. It has to do with, it's a choice. It's in my DNA. So the first thing is the amateur, that's the greyhound. Because when it gets done, you bring the food back to the kennel. The lion, it hunts every day. It goes and claims its turf. Don't be the lion, be the greyhound. I don't want to give him too much. So that's the first, that after you make the say, you got to say, I got to come like the lion. That's what you have to do. Then here comes the big one. And I'll go into this in depth. Daily nitty gritty goals they map out their day they don't spend their day they invest it it's all everything's going toward that vision that belief that faith and you can't say you got faith you got to show it you you, you got to show it you know you, yeah yeah you have faith that the sea's going to part we the israelites but how about having faith that the Jordan's going to part when you got the when you got the Ark of the Covenant? That it's going to part after you show me you got faith. So it comes down to a decision first. Then after you make the decision, you have to get to a point where you're going to say, "I'm not." Watch this. I'm not interested. I'm committed. Yeah. That's a whole different. Everybody's interested. You say I'm committed. Now here's the next question: Are you committed? What you going to give up to get it? Good. So the pro says, I'm committed. They get the picture and then their daily nitty gritty goals, they're investing their time to become that picture. They ain't interested, they're committed. And the big, I think the breakfast of champions is daily nitty gritty goals. It's the big thing that we pounded in the head of the Crimson Tide last year. Mm -hmm. Daily nitty gritty goals. Yeah. Well, I think about a saying I used to say as a basketball coach, the chicken lays an egg and she's involved. The hog gives his meat and he's committed. Yeah. <laughs> Which are yeah. you the ticking of the hog, folks? And, and well, you know what? It, 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 it's the, the, the interested, it's a feeling. The committed is a choice. Yeah. The pro goes by choices. The amateur goes by feelings. Well, and I say that a lot. For, the, for those of you that are on here, they're coach, being coached by me. The amateur, the pr pros never listen to their feelings. Journey doesn't feel like singing, don't stop believing. The football player doesn't feel like getting hit on Sunday. The great salesperson doesn't feel like prospecting. And you, you've got to get past your feelings here. So let's talk about 
the importance of recruiting because I'm, I, I look at it like this. We recruit and attract better talent. We coach and develop that talent. We retain and optimize that talent. Okay, if I had to sum, sum it up. How important is it? Because there's a lot of leaders on here tonight that are trying to take, you know, in my opinion, average people with an average engine that have, that, have, that are still playing on Friday nights and haven't made the decision to play on Sunday. And I love that saying, how important is the recruiting piece of this to go out? And what would you tell? Because I know a lot of teams bring you in to evaluate the talent and you're looking for certain ingredients, right? Like I got this new book coming out called Flip the Switch about prey drive and what I've learned from 28 years of activating the, the prey drive in a person, that animal instinct in a person to go see it. And I can typically tell, although, although you and I've kind of talked about assessment for that, to know how much prey drive a person has, what are you looking for when it comes to the recruiting piece? You have to decide what basically your culture is. I just did a whole day deal for a company in Birmingham on selection. So, and I've done it for years. You have to decide exactly what you want. Like what matches you? What is gonna be, what I say is this, what people don't understand about Alabama is standard. And when I say standard, it's not, well, the standard's winning. No, that's not it. It's the process. What's the standard? You receive coaching and you, you know how to separate the who from the do. What's the standard? You lift others. Our biggest standard is be a and not a but. He worked hard in, in, call, in high school. And when he got here, he was better than what we thought. He worked hard in high school. And when he got here, he lifted others. He worked hard in high school, but he quits now. He worked hard in high school, but he possibly doesn't get his way. Be an and not a but. Which we always say, it being an but a, not a but. You hear Saban State this stuff you ever see him on TV. He steals my stuff. He don't always give me kickback, coach. So that's where you start. But you have to decide what are we about. And the best predictor always of the future is the past. So I'm with the Pittsburgh Steelers. One of my guys leaves, and I'm going to stick around. And we're going to, I'm not going to mention this player's name. But four times he didn't show up for the interview. They still took him. You know why they cut him? He quit showing up. It wasn't hard. It's not hard. Yeah. Best predictor of the future is the past. We had another ball player they wanted to take. I kid you not, I blew this so bad. I looked at his rap sheet. I said, you know, you had three pods of marijuanas. He said, yeah, it was a hard year. I said, what happened? I blew this coach. He said, oh, I, I, I had three babies. I stood, I go, oh, your girlfriend had triplets. <laughs> you know why they cut him? He kept smoking marijuana. Decide what you want and look for it. And I start off, tell me of a time. Tell me of a time. Tell me when you tell me of a time when you were discouraged. Tell me how you overcame it. Tell me of a time where you want to give up. Tell me about a time when you encouraged someone else. Tell me about, so you have to decide what you want and you go back and look for it very, very specifically. And it's going to be there, but you have to decide what you want. And then you go look for it. Be selection is everything. With the Steelers, they brought me in. Pittsburgh Steelers, while we were there, had the best record for 25 years, they, the second best behind the 49ers. They had the smallest record. They had the smallest budget, I'm sorry. And so we just look for it. This is what we want. We want you to be able to take coaching, be able to overcome adversity, resiliency. We want you to be able to lift others. You know, those are things that we look for. And that's what we went after. And so you want to decide, here's what we want, and you look for it. You know, back in the day, you're, you know, you're with somebody, loves new, and, you know, you look at her, you look at him, whoever you're dating, and she said, well, my ex said this about me. You're thinking, your ex was a jerk. You're with him three months. You know what you're thinking? Man, your ex has some good insight. If it, It'll be there in the past if you look for it. But you have to decide what you want, and what we do at Alabama is standards. These are our standards. We don't come off of them. Yep. They, when they come to hear me and you on the giddy up, we're going to teach them standards. Yep. Well, I think if you're, if, you, if you're out there right now, how many of you feel like over the, just as a raise of hands, how many of you feel like you've lowered your standards at some point? I'm telling you. Right. Just look at all the people. Look, that's what and, COVID did. Yeah. And you, and you, and you basically lowered your standard and you allowed, you know, uh, I remember being, this, this is what really keeps me up at night, Dr. Elko. When I was a basketball coach, you showed up 15 minutes early to, to everything. If you, if, you, if you were late, you didn't get in practice. If you didn't practice, you didn't play. Uh, if you didn't, right? And in 10 years, I had one person show up late. Adults, 
have lowered their standards, folks. And you have got at some point as the leader to say, look, man, this is it. This is what we're doing here. This is what we believe in. We believe in showing up early. We believe in staying late. We believe when a, when a man asks you to go one mile, you go two. We, we believe in always over delivering in what we promise. Like at some point, and, and this coachable piece that Dr. Elko is talking about, I can't tell you, you know, when I quit coaching kids and started coaching adults, I had to soften up the adults, adult, right? You say something to a kid, they took it. You say something to an adult, they start crying, right? And, and you got you to gotta get tougher. If you want a guy like me to coach you or Dr. Elko to coach you, you got to say, man, I give you an unlimited license. You're here because you're an expert. You've been doing this your whole life. You coach some of the top people in the world. You have an unlimited license to speak into my life, to get me to another frequency, to move me from A to B, activate my pre-drive. And I just see so many adults that I coach guys that they've lowered their standards to his point and they're not that coachable. They, they want to get from A to B, but they can't take the coaching. So talk a little bit about that, Dr. Elko, because me coming from the sports world, you know, very intense. Uh, you know, I, I, I put there's three components of prey drive in the new book. There's activation, there's persistence, there's intensity. I've identified five activators of that drive that I use every day. But to speak a little bit about how a person can, can, can become coachable to the point where they seek out that coaching and accountability to get to the next, the, the next level. Because I think a lot of adults need to hear that from a guy who's coaching the kind of people you're coaching. I think that what my phrase is do simple better. And it's, I, I, to me, almost everything's along one line, feelings and choices. And we have an epidemic, a big epidemic, and it's uh, offended. That is the epidemic today. You never hear me speak. I won't go into that. Everybody's touchy. And what's the problem with that? Because not being offended, offenses, they will come. The person's not offended, it's a choice. So I go, you gotta go into self-talk. Right. You know, I, I'm, I'm accidentally cut somebody off. I'm traveling to Atlanta. I got my mask on, my glass are foggy. And this guy calls me a body part. It wasn't a toe. But when I travel ahead of time, I go, Kevin, we're not gonna be offended today. It's gonna be a choice. I just say, you know, God bless, God bless you. So the first thing is not being offended is a choice and it takes practice. We are, the fact is, this is, I'm doing a lot of talks these days on getting back to work. 39% of people are going to quit if they have to go back to work and people are out of practice on how to handle people, interact with people. So you have to, you have to first make a decision. One, you're not going to be offended back to that Two, Then you have to practice not being offended. Three, it's self-talk. I'm you, when they come, they're going to hear self-talk. I'm going to teach you how to talk to you. So, so I come in, I come in years ago. This might have been the first, second year. I didn't go to first year on purpose. Second year savings there. And I'm going, to, what we teach the great, all the teams. I am with a number of championships. We teach all accountability. And we teach something called catfishing. Catfishing is from a, t a, a TV movie where the, they send cod from Alaska to China alive. And it's all mushy from just laying in the, in the water. They put catfish to nip at it. We teach players in Alabama to nip at each other. We, and we got it from, from Miami where, where Saban found me to nip at each other. And so um, I said, you know, I was saying to Saban, he starts saying, uh, I, he, go, I goes, he goes, everybody around here is too blankety blank sensitive, which what is what he always says, but it, it ain't e easy not being sensitive with coach. And I go, you got to separate the, here comes the self-talk, separate the who from the do. When somebody gives you feedback, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying Rocky. I'm not saying Mark. I'm not saying Amy. You're not good. Go to the behavior. Mm -hmm. And when we test them for years with the Steelers, when you get feedback, you say who you are is wrong or what you did is wrong. No, who you are is unbelievable. You're a champ. Mm -hmm. Have a strong self-concept. Yeah. change the behavior but quit being offended and shaming yourself go to the behavior you know in the i'm also licensed addictions an addict is always shamed you know what shame means who i am is wrong mm. guilt is actually a good thing what i did's wrong you need to say what i did's wrong 
Yeah. You don't never ever have to say who I am is wrong. So you separate the who from the do. So if coaches drive on me, you're not, hey, you're not boxing out down there when we shoot a fire start. You didn't say who I am is wrong. You said box out. Yes. And on a leadership level, don't call people names. Go to the, hey, I love you, but let's do that different. That's how I do my kids. I, I, you're, I, you're crazy, man. Good. I'm nuts about you, but let's change this behavior. Yeah. So self-talk, separate the who from the do. And look, in the last days, more people be offended than any other time. It must be midnight and everybody's touchy. <laughs> Christ touchy. Yeah, I, and I've seen that a lot more lately. Now, when you think about the, we're going to get into self-talk. So you guys know the four weeks that we're going to do in July. It's going to be one night a week in July. Dr. Elko and I are going to break down the self-talk, the language of winners, how to build cultures, how to bounce back from adversity. Basically, what we're going to be doing is going to be a master class on battle testing. And, and that's why we want you to come back in July and we want you to really be coached by us. Dr. Elko, why, why in the business world, you know, I know you work with some of the top people in the world, uh, just like I do. And why is coaching for adults? Why, why does the adult in the business world have a hard time understanding why they need a coach in their life? Uh, as kids, we have coaches. My daughter has a, has a level 10 gymnastics coach right now. She has a horse riding coach. She has, a, you know, I've worked with different uh, psychologists to work with her. She's nine years old, guys. She turns nine in August. I want my daughter to have the best coaches she can because I know from being a coach for so many years, who's coaching you matters, okay? It really matters. So when you see adults and they get over to the world, and they're like, man, I don't need a coach. I'm good. Why do you think that is in the business world that it's such a, it's such a hard thing for people to understand that who's coaching you really matters? A lot of what we're going through, coach, is evolutionary. We've kind of outlived. So we really would like to be safe. Mm -hmm. We really would like to be uh, safe and secure more than happy and successful. So that's why we look for the bad. But it's also if a lot of stuff I've been looking at is evolutionary psychology. We want to be autonomous. It's in us. And if you look at the research, a lot of research by Desi up at University of Rochester, is there something in us that wants to be autonomous? Yeah. And we want to be, you know, uh, you know, all that and ran, let's be, uh, you know, we self-reliable and uh, let's go ahead and be somebody that needs someone. It's kind of in us. But what you want to do to be a success and to be happy is break some of the things that you're naturally programmed to do need no one depend on no one and we we really have to break some of our programming we're velcro for bad because we want to protect ourselves. we're velcro to be independent we're velcro in so many ways do we need a tribe but we don't want the tribe to tell us what we want to do if we get into a discussion with somebody and i tell us with financial people all the time there's something in us that wants to win it's evolutionary but you have to say what's the objective there's things in us be independent need a tribe but don't depend on any of them to the point that they're going to teach you and lead you. You're the boss. You're the one. It's in us. So you almost have to re what we're going to try doing this in our time together is reprogram the thinking. You want to reprogram that and get to a point where if you say it over and over again, neurons that fire together, wire together, you re rope, we reprogram the mind. That's why I'm really into cognitive psychology. That's why I'm really into how that you you do that and you have to look at people who've had huge aa get a sponsor i just was down your way i'm just speaking in nashville to, to uh kw keller williams and if you walk through the uh, hall of fame of the country where every one of them vince gill jim reeves every one of them had a mentor everybody had somebody they patterned after when i came through school i said i patterned after and so you really have somebody that you pattern after that shows you the way, but it's not natural. What we're trying to do isn't natural. Winning isn't natural. You have to reprogram your brain to make it natural. And we are program evolutionary to be independent. I don't need anybody. I could do it on my own, but we're gonna break some of the natural tendencies and some of the natural programming and program you to be the 3% to supercharge exceptional. Now, let's go back, folks, because if you didn't catch that part right there, maybe one of the biggest highlights of tonight. 
because I study human nature, right? Human nature is, when, when I study human nature, why do we start with good intention? Why do we fail to follow through? Why do we experience guilt? Why do good people turn bad? Why do, why do some people get lazy and complacent? These are the questions that I study because of when you're coaching as many people as I am, uh, it, it helps you to understand why do people do this? Why does a person say one day it changed my life and the next day they want to quit? What, right? And he said something that I want to go back and I actually want you to repeat that, Dr. Elko, because like I said, a lot of these people are leaders with big teams. They may have a thousand people on their team, 2000 people on their team. You said we're wired to be safe and secure, right? Versus right. what? Happy and successful. You're, not, you're a program to be happy. You're programmed to be safe and secure. You're not programmed to be a success. That's why so few people are. So what we teach, what we're going to teach, like at Alabama, we teach a language and we keep teaching to reprogram the brain. See a little, see a lot, see a lot, see nothing. Live in vision, don't live in circumstance. So what, now what? And so you keep on doing it because you're trying to collectively, you're trying to change an individual's brain, neurons that fire together, wire together. You're trying to change their brain to go higher, but you're trying to get the collective brain to go higher. So develop a language so that everybody is wired, but we aren't naturally wired to be happy. We're not naturally wired to be successful. We're naturally wired to be safe and secure. Yeah. And, we're ha and, and so that's what we want. So that's why we're Velcro for the bad. We're looking for bad and we're Velcro for let's not do anything. But see, that's true 500 years ago because you know, if something bad happens, it might happen again. We have outlived our evolution. You got to reprogram the brain. And yeah. to be a success today, you got to come into today's thinking and not be back evolutionary years and years ago. And every organ in your body is programmed to keep you safe, including your brain. Yeah. So, so if you're out there and you're watching tonight and you're looking for advantage, you really have to become a master of human potential. You really have to understand how the greats get an advantage. So I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to take a few questions. We're going to post a link. This is just a preview of what we're going to be doing in July. Folks, you could spend four weeks with Dr. Elko and I uh, for $97. Nowhere in the world can you get coached by two guys like us for four weeks for under a hundred bucks on language, on how, how to self-talk. We're really going to get into self-talk, how you build cultures of winning, right? And, and so if you're out there and you're looking at this, many of you have already purchased, but if you're out there and you're serious about playing at the next level, man, this is going to be a great four weeks. We will record it. You can get the replays if you can't be there on the nights we're doing it. But, man, you're making a huge investment to be coached by guys who won 30 national championships, works with some of the best people in the world. And Dr. Elko, is, is, this is really, really something that I really want to encourage you to do. Your kids should see stuff like this. Your, your, your spouse should see things like this. Because I'm sitting there, it's reminding me of the standards that we need. It's reminding me of the self-talk. It's reminding me not to be offended. It's reminding me, right? And I think that's what a good coach does sometimes. They remind you of things you know you should be doing, but you're not doing. So one of the things, Dr. Elko, I'm going to ask one more question, and we'll take a few questions from the group, is I know from, from being a championship coach, the repetition that it takes, the, the role play, the simulation. The, the battle testing day in and day out. We practice a lot more than you perform. Talk a little bit about the importance because there's a lot of salespeople on here. The importance of repetition. We talk about neurons that, that, that wire together, fire together. That's the language you use. Uh, so, so talk a little bit about repetition and why that's so important in the business world. Your conscious mind is a post-it note. That's all it is. That's all it is. It's a post-it note. That's what it can hold. And your, your uh, subconscious mind's a supercomputer. I've been reading all this stuff. Claude Bristol, The Magic of Believing. I've I went all back, The Science of, uh, the science of uh, Rich by Wallace Waddles. Oh, yeah. Think, of course, Think and Grow Rich. I've been doing all this 1930s, 1940s stuff recently. And what they said is accurate. There's nothing as powerful as repetitive thought. So what you're trying to do, can you go get inspired? Listen to me. Inspiration is for amateurs. It ain't not about inspiration. We're going after the supercomputer. Yeah. Inspiration for amateurs. And I, I get it. There's guys out there going to inspire you. 
you're trying to program the net brain, neurons that fire together, wire together. I don't even go by that motivational speaking stuff. I got my doctorate, we're going after the brain chemistry. So your conscious mind is a post-it note. That's not what you want to train. You want to train the supercomputer. You know, we tell them in Alabama, don't practice you do right. Practice you can't do wrong. To practice you can't do it wrong. We teach it over, do it over and over and over. Because this is in psychology, this is called the Yerkes Dotson law. When pressure comes up, ingrained behaviors come out. Well, you you know, I just I had to work with a baseball pitcher. Got, no, I got to work with a baseball pitcher in between here, big time pitcher. And he's now he was starting, now he's coming out the bullpen. He can't get the ball over the plate. I go, you're trying, what you're doing is you're trying to come from your conscious mind. You got to come from your subconscious mind, shut this off, say the word trust, and throw the ball to catch his glove. But we try to do life and we try to do decisions. We try to, you're not going to go as far as your positive vision. You're going to go as far as your habits. And so it's got to come down to, I've got to make my brain from doing it over and over and over. I have to make the subconscious. I've got to tune it. So repetition trains the self-conscious. So let me say it again. Your conscious mind is a post-it note. Your subconscious mind, supercomputer. So if you go, everything you're hearing tonight, you hear Saban say it. He steals it. He don't give no kickback to the boy. He'll steal it. But we're not trying to go down there. So we have a Friday huddle with Nick. So him and I go over that and write it. I do, I write up the, the talk for the uh, strength, whoever's the strength coach at the time, his Thursday night talk matches the, matches the Friday huddle. And then I do the film for Friday night. It all comes together. We're not trying to inspire. We're teaching over and over and over till we get into the supercomputer. You know what we're going to call battle testing, charging up the supercomputer for the fight. And that, that's what you're doing. You're not trying to, because the fight is pressure. So your, your most ingrained behavior will come out during the pressure. So you're going after the supercomputer. Hey, you know what? If you recorded this, send this back to me. I need to see this interview. Yeah. But that's, well, what, you, that's what you're going after. Yeah. And so, so I, want to, I want you guys to hear me. Because what we're trying to do is get everybody on this call to go pro. And to leave your amateur desires behind. And when you and to make a decision to play at the next level, and when you make a decision to play at the next level, you go to the pros and you say, "How do we need to do it? How? Do, what kind of repetition? What kind of role play? What kind of testing?" We used to make our basketball players shoot uh, X number of shots, five hundred shots after practice. They're with me about five and a half hours a day at the high school level, five and a half hours a day for four years, and after practice, they'd have taken extra five hundred shots, and. Um, one year when I won a championship, I wouldn't let two or three of the players shoot because they weren't good shooters. Their job was to screen and rebound. <laughs> okay. And uh, I make them, but I make them all take 500 shots a day. And I'm going around the deal and one of the players had a bad attitude. And I said, what, what's, what's, what's the problem with you? She said, I don't understand. You made me take 500 shots a day, but you won't let me shoot in the game. And you know, us old coaches, I was like, man, I'll make it take a thousand shots a day. <laughs> but here's the deal. I went home that night. And I listened to what she said. You make me take a th 500 shots a day, but you won't let me shoot in the game. And because of that, I was restricting. I was restricting the, the players. We get in big games, they guard my top two or three players. They'd leave those players open. They wouldn't shoot because they didn't think they could make shots because I wouldn't let them shoot. And so I went back the next day and I said, you know what? You're exactly right. I was wrong. From now on, anytime they leave you open, everybody's got a green light to go for it, to shoot it. Every number, every stat we had went up. Now everything went up. They couldn't guard all five players, right? Then they couldn't just double team our best players. I learned a valuable lesson there, man. We were that repetition and role play. The players knew how to do it. They need to quit thinking about it. They need to just get in the game and shoot, right? Because that's what they were trained to do. So in business, we got to increase and go pro here, folks. And that's really what tonight, tonight, tonight was worth the whole 97 bucks for July. Uh, and, and if you don't get in that, man, something bad wrong, because there was some really, really good stuff in here tonight. So we got time for one or two questions. If you want to ask me or Dr. Elko anything. And then, like I said, four Co weeks in July. Coach, let me respond to something. Yes, please. Uh, when you guys come, I was undergraduate biochem major and the good ones can make it easy. McKinley, I want you to hear what I'm going to say now. I'm going to give you a real simple concept. 
McKinley, just listen to what I'm going to say. Think like a gardener. Mm. Just think like a gardener. Okay. So McKinley, let's just say I go three areas, my career, my calling, my body, and relationships, three areas. If a gardener wants something, McKinley, what do they do? They plant it over and over and over. You don't have to plant weeds. They, so your mind and spirit is a garden. How does a gardener think with that garden? They plant into what they want. So here's all I want you to do. I want you to just think about what you want in life. And I'm gonna get this in depth when we get together. Write it every day on a card, just like a gardener would. Mm -hmm. And because McKinley's saying this is a little bit above me. No, it's not. We're going to make a plane. And I want you to plant what you want every day. Simple thing. Do simple better. And write it. And write it in past tense like it already happened. I have a very healthy body. I have warm relationships. I'm going to teach you the as-if principle. We're going to learn that. Some of the Elko Ice, they know the as-if principle. I have a healthier body. I have a career that, that is, I give good work for good pay. I want you to write it every day till we get to you in July. Think like a gardener, keep on planting that in the field every day till you get to us and we'll take you to the next level. That's good. That's really good. All right, folks, we've got time for a few questions and, uh, and thank you for being here tonight. We want to give you a preview of what we're going to cover in four weeks. Uh, so who would like to go first? Erica Garcia, all the way from Cancun, Mexico. How you doing, Erica? Thank you very Thank you very much, Coach, and thank you very much, Doctor. And my question is, what is it specifically that you did besides that repetition uh, different with your biggest, biggest challenge, which maybe was not your biggest win, but got you in the future to your biggest win? What was it? Is there, is there a key factor or something that you avoid doing or that you caught yourself not doing or, or something that, that triggered in the future that reminder to then reach higher? Yeah, that's good. Dr. Elko, you wanna take that one? Was there something that I did to get to a big place in my life? Um, to me, uh, I say story all the time there's something in you, I call it your 68, because Yalmer Yager from the Penguins were the number 68, because that was the year of the Russian occupation of Czechoslovakia. And when they played in the Olympics, they played, they played Russia. And he said, he said to himself, he said, everybody, 1968 was the year of the Russian occupation of Czechoslovakia. That's who we're playing, Russia. I dedicate this to my grandfather. Erica, I do one thing every, I say, I, I say three things to me every day and to crow prayer in my mind. Here's the first one. I'm going to go be a blessing to somebody. I don't care what happens. I don't care what happens in my day. And some, I, the first thing I say to myself every day is I'm not looking for a blessing today. I'm looking to be a blessing. So I focus outwardly. Number two, the second thing I say is if you're chopping a tree and a tree don't fall, you, you don't quit. The tree falls going to fall. We're impatient anymore. So the second one I say is keep chopping. The third thing I say every day is one phrase. And we and so what now what? So I train my brain every day with three things. Can I be a blessing? Like I walked in here and I said, how can I be a blessing to Coach Burton and his troop? Number two, keep chopping. So what now what? And I say to our program my mind. And when something comes, so what now what keep chopping and i'm not going to get through a day until i bless somebody yeah and erica you know one thing i would tell you erica is one of our top students if you look over this is my this is my home office if you look over on each side of of where i'm at here there's a picture of me speaking at uh, 10x on both sides that's me in front of 10,000 people uh have you ever heard me say we made uh we produced about a million dollars for me speaking on that stage uh in in an hour and those are reminders for me. There's, there's pictures of me in a championship rings. There's different things that r remind me. And I wear my championship ring uh, many times to remind me that I know how to win. I know, I know what it took. I know it took a decade. 
I know, I know 80 hours a week for a decade. I knew it took eight hours a day on Sunday after I get up and go to church on Sunday morning. It reminds me that I know how to win, man. And so there's certain things that, that, that when you, when you, when I get down, I go back to these moments in my life, standing on that stage, standing in the middle of that court, getting to certain levels. So I think you need those in life to, to remind you that you know how to do it. Phil Mills, what you got, big guy? Coach Burt, Dr. Elko, it is a pleasure. Um, great stuff tonight. Here's my question. Emotion, feelings, so powerful. So Dr. Elko, my question is, do you, is the thought that the repetition ultimately reprograms the emotion and feelings, or is the thought that you got to consciously kind of put the new emotion and feeling in with the repetition? I'd like your thoughts on that. I, I, I think feel, I think emotions start I think motivation and feeling start things. I think discipline and choices finish. So I think the repetition comes in more feel when you have that moment where you become so emotional that you either want to quit, you want to pout, you want to get offended. And I think that's the time where you have to train your brain that you step in or your brain just naturally knows how to push through that. And so I think emotions are wonderful. You know, Martin Luther King did stand up and said, I got a process. He said, I got a plan. He's, I got a dream. You know, you get the elephant fire. The first thing is the elephant. Next comes the elephant driver and the elephant path. So the first thing we got to do is use our emotion to get started, but that runs out. So you train your brain that when it runs out, then I stay focused and then the choice kicks in and I finish. You start the game excited. You get in the third quarter and you had a couple picks. Then you got to train your brain and say, here's where we push through. Here's where we do our, our mental habits. So emotion starts it your discipline, your training finishes it. Yeah, well, that's good. Love it, thank you. Yeah, and I say a lot, you know, I told you there's three three components of the prey drive that I talk about, activation, persistence, and intensity. Like Dr. Elko, I break down, codify a lot of concepts. I studied the, you know, 20 motivational theories, deconstructed those theories, and then codified that to write that book. And there's three components, activation, persistence, intensity. And, at, and when he's talking about that emotion, starts it and discipline finishes discipline derivative of the word disciple means to give yourself to a person or cause you believe in so I always ask people do you believe in your future and everybody says yes i've never had a person tell me no i always ask where does your future live and people would go in here well it actually lives in your imagination you go there in the mind before you go there in the body so so the, get excited that's good Mo you, you see it through its logical conclusion and that's really the battle tested concept we're going to work on ryan what you got Yes, sir. So thanks, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Um, my question is probably piggybacking off the one that was asked uh, two questions ago, but it's basically when it comes to um, habits, should I be trying to remove old habits, bad habits, or should I be focused on replacing those habits by actively pursuing new ones that are going to benefit me? Go ahead, Dr. Echo. Don't plant grass, pull weeds. You'll never remove it. The more you remove it, the more it'll get ingrained and dig its roots in. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't pull, don't pull weeds, keep planting grass. If you keep on planting over and over and over, it'll come over it. So don't worry about getting rid of, keep on putting it over. This, y'all are smart. I mean, this is a good crowd. You got me so far up, I can hang out with you for long, as long as you want until coach cuts me off here. But what you want to do is keep planting the grass over and over and over until it gets so strong that it takes, it takes it over. You know, I got pretty nice yard, but I'm out there myself. I got all those people treating it, but I go back in and keep planting grass. And it, it, it kind of is um, furthering the, que the good question that Erica asked. Keep on going over. Don't worry about getting rid of it because the more you try to get rid of it, the more it will stay. You know, the more it will stay. So you want to keep on over and over and over, Ryan, plant the grass till it pushes the other one out. Mm -hmm. And you wire the neurons. You can't make neurons go away. You just make other ones stronger and take their place. Yeah. And just, just for clarity, Dr. Elko, for everybody's purpose, when you say neurons that wire together, fire together, can you explain that, what you mean to the Neurons that fire together, wire together. Fire together, yeah. if, if you keep wiring, okay, it, 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 from the athletic world, there's something called deliberate practice. The first time you do something, it's kind of like you sit a neuron. A neuron carries a message through your brain. It's like a real thin wire. The first time you do it, Ryan, it's like driving a truck through an alley. 
But if you keep on repping over and over and over, well, you teach deliberate practice, and you do it over and over and over. Now it starts to get wider. And if, when you talk about biology, the neuron starts to get what they call myelin sheath around it. And so it's, it, it starts to travel a lot faster. You keep doing it over and over and over. Now you're in a four lane highway. If you do it so much, your goal is to make that thought like an Audubon, like full. And the more you do it, you're wiring it over and over and over. And like I play guitar. So every time I'm playing my guitar, when I have a challenge, you know what I say? Neurons are growing. Your neurons are growing. A lot like if you're in a weight room and you and you you have momentary failure, you say, well, I just got stronger. The mind's the same way. You keep on pushing to get frustration and you become front, friends with frustration. And you say, okay, my mind just got stronger. So neurons carry messages in our brain. And every time you speak something, you think something, it starts to develop that neuron. If you do it deliberately over and over and over, then it becomes like a super highway. Mm -hmm. That's what you're going toward. Yeah. And so neurons carry messages. If you keep on firing them, they wire and they'll wire into like a thick cable in your brain. That's yeah. what you're shooting for. Yeah. So if you could think about what are the what what thick cable would carry me to winning and success and a healthy body and having warm relationships and forgiving, those are the neurons you're wiring. You're not going to that's the supercomputer I'm talking about. That's what you're going after. Yeah. That's so, what will separate this. I'm not putting anybody else down, but there'll be some understandable, simple brain science to this. Yeah, that's good. Can I can I finish this with one one more question? Absolutely. Um, so so, what about the boredom that can creep in through repetition? How do you guys handle that? I, I think it's there. If you talk, if you talk, like if you read about anybody who's a pro, they have learned to come to grips with the boredom. And they've, and I, I had a, when I used to be at the United States Olympic Committee, and I used to have this, uh, this, I used to always ask the strength coach, what is the biggest enemy of winning? He said, boredom. It's what you said. You're onto it because to do it over and over and over, you know, you're playing guitar, you're doing scales over and over and over. It, don't confuse boredom with awareness. Even though you're bored, try to keep, make a choice, keep your awareness so you're picking it up. But boredom is a big, big issue to, to becoming great. And you, you accept it. And I understood what he said. He goes, the enemy to become a great as Olympiad is, I, I was out there when Bonnie Blair was there, skater. She's out there, Ryan, trying to take a hundredth of a second off of her time. Mm -hmm. It's extremely boring. Yeah. And so we, you know, we act like this winning stuff's all fireworks and so forth. No, there, you have to pay the price. And there is that in there. This is a really, really, you know, intelligent question. You got to come to grips with the boredom that's involved with it. And what, and here's what I'd say to you. What is boring to others, let that thrill you. Because you just make an opinion about this is part of me becoming great. Yeah. Okay. That's really, really good. good question. Yeah, that is a good question. All right, you, David Boo. Hey, Coach. Hey, uh, Dr. Elko. Elko. Um, so my question is, um, what kind of mindset do you give your players or instill in them when they're, they're tired, they're uh, – They've got setbacks. They're losing in the game. It's the, the last quarter, and everybody's kind of giving up on it. What's, what's kind of the mindset you've instilled for them to get past those feelings and emotions? It's what you said. It's a feeling and emotion, so you make a choice. And list, list this phrase. It, it's, an old, it's from old text. The arrow was renewed in his hand. What it means, if you keep on doing and keep going, energy comes back. And so you don't get any the, – the arrow was renewed in his hand. It's, it's, it's an old phrase, which means as you keep on going, you find renewal. And so what I tell them is there's a period and you choose to. And if you look at the research, even when you feel like you're completely exhausted, you still got 40% left in your tank. Mm. So what you tell yourself is keep on pushing through that. You don't know that could be a lot of things, but a lot of it, then you recharge. There's a period where you gain not by resting, by going, by pushing. So what we say is everything is a choice. So when you feel it, you choose to keep going and we're going to strengthen your choice muscle. So you you keep on choosing it, then you're firing that neuron and you push through it. And then you learn, David, that when that keeps hitting, you've now become accustomed and you now trained your mind to push through it. But the arrow is renewed in your hands. Water wears the rock. We get phrases say, push through this, and then it comes back. But even physiologically, when you think you're completely done, 
you still got 40% to go. Yeah. So you learn to push through it. And you, so here's a phrase I got for you. Ready? Do the right thing. My feelings will catch up with me. Yeah. Keep doing what you're doing. Your feelings will catch up with you. I feel like quitting, but I'm going to keep on going. They'll catch up with me later. Yeah, yeah. I, I, David, when you think about the great people that do what they do every day, um, they, they don't, this is real, this is a real separator between amateurs and professionals. The, the, the professionals don't feel like it any more than the amateur does, but they keep doing it because they understand the, that, that slight nuance they can get, right? It becomes, a, it just becomes a habit, man. We just get up and we do it, man. We train our brains to do it. We fight through our feelings, right? And that's a big, big problem in today's world is I don't feel like prospecting. I don't feel like following up. I don't feel like dealing with this issue. I don't feel like doing it. And to me, the first time that you use words like that, or I hear people say I'm overwhelmed. And uh, man, over, overwhelmed is when you're broke and you're sleeping in your car and you don't have anything, that's overwhelmed. Having the opportunity we have in America today, folks, that is not overwhelmed. I hear people say that I'm overwhelmed, I'm so busy, I'm overwhelmed with everything. I'm like, no, the way you're looking at this is all wrong, okay? You, 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 you're looking at it all wrong. You're overwhelmed in a good way, not a bad way, okay? But you never very seldom hear big time producers use those words. I don't think I can get it all in. I'm overwhelmed. I'm, you just don't hear people talk about that, man. Eric Tibbs, we've got time for two more, then we're out tonight. Well. Coach, does that get into what you're talking about, passion versus purpose, right? So I'm passionate about something, but I have a purpose. And so can you talk about that a little bit? I, I have a different, I actually have a different philosophy than most people do, do on this subject. I actually believe that uh, many times we don't, I, I believe we don't find our why and then do something big in the world. I actually believe our purpose finds us when we pursue and work the muscle. I didn't know I wanted to, uh, okay, you hear a lot about find your why, find your, I think Simon Sinek is a very, very, a genius, but, uh, but I, I perf after coaching people for 28 years, I actually would tell you, I didn't know I wanted to coach adults until I coached adults. I didn't know I wanted to write books until I wrote a book. I didn't know I wanted to do this until I did it. So I actually believe that your purpose kind of finds you. And Dr. Elko alluded to that earlier, that the book grabbed him. He didn't grab it. And so I, I think you know, sometimes I say that at conferences and people come up to me and thank me. They're like, oh my God, thank God. I, I didn't, I, you know, I hadn't found my why. I felt like a complete loser. I actually think you pursue a curiosity, something you're curious about. And then your purpose kind of finds you when you're pursuing something. I don't like this. I do like this. This is my talent. This is what I love to do. This is a need in the world I can fulfill. This is what my conscience is telling me to do. And at the intersection of those things, man, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, man. That's that's kind of, that's my personal belief. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that's just my personal belief. So I don't get into a lot of of. Uh, to me, passion is a is a a definition of passion is irresistible belief for motive or action. Irresistible belief for motive or action. That's passion. Okay. I like to use the word conviction a lot more than I do passion. I've had a revelation because of my revelation. I now have a conviction because of my conviction. I'm now willing to take an action. That's a cycle that I see a lot. Dr. Elko, you want to add to that? No, I ain't going to touch that. <laughs> that. That was too good right there. All I can do is mess that one up. That's good right there. You know, that's the cake and the icing. That's good. <laughs> Kathleen Carter. Hey, Coach. Um, Dr. Eric, you actually just kind of touched on what I was going to ask <laughs> Coach Burke is about, do you feel like you've got to have a why to be able to have the drive behind it? You know, having that drive pull you versus kind of moving forward with, as you said, a curiosity. So you really kind of touched on what my question was, because we do hear a lot about like, you got to have your why. That's what drives you. You got to have the why to make you cry. Um, <clears throat> so. So I I'm going to tell you something funny. I was, you know, early, uh, not I was several years ago, I was out and I was speaking somewhere and I, I said, man, I'm out here doing this for my wife and with my kids. I came home that night and uh, my wife said, uh, I saw that video of you saying that you were out there on the road doing this for us. And uh, she looked at me and she said, no, you're not. She said, so let's quit lying to everybody. She said, why you're out there doing this is for you. 
It feeds something inside of you. Now we benefit from it and we got a good life because of it, but you ain't doing it for us. Let's just be real clear about that. And she was right. I do what I do for me. There's something about it that feeds me of helping other people. I don't know why it comes from somewhere, but, but a lot of people go out there and say, I'm doing this for my wife. I'm doing it for my kids. Uh, and, and it's just, a, you know, it's a politically correct thing to say, but it ain't the truth, folks. And you need to tell the truth, okay? Why you do what you do, okay? So my top five producers right now that I coach, if I ask them what their why was, they probably can't tell me. Some people just got something you can't put in them and you can't take it out of them, man. They get up and they do it because because that's who they are. Stone cold killing machines, man. They, they, that's from some, they've had con certain conditioning somewhere along the way that has gotten them to this, where, where this is what they do. It's very hard to explain. That's why I think the recruiting piece is so critical. Okay. All right. One more for Dr. Elko and then we're going to shut it down folks. Tim Roller, you got a big team. This is the man. This is the man right here, Dr. Elko. Uh, Dr. Elko, he's got over 440 coaches in his team, thousands of people. Okay. Tim's a high D on a on disc profile, wants to do something really big with his team. Tim, what would you ask Dr. Elko about the recruiting piece or about connecting with the team? Oh, man. Uh, it's so many things going through my mind after this. I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, the one thing that I, I, I don't want to use the word struggle with, but but constantly try and overcome it is getting people to where they say they want to be when the actions don't meet that. Um, I, I think that's the biggest thing that I see in business is everybody wants, everybody wants to get to the top of the mountain. Most people check out when they get to base camp. Any words on that? Oh, I, I think, first of all, I love what you're doing. And I think, I think first of all, comes the power of connection. First you connect. And it's a Tom Lange phrase about, you know, to get people what they really want, you gotta get them to do something they don't necessarily wanna do. And I first would just connect one-on-one -on -one or something powerful in connection. And then I, I like, I really like the difference between praise and encouragement. Praise is, I'm noticing them, praise is the result. Encouragement is the process. And I think you have to say, look, um, I, I don't, you know, Nick came to me and said, we don't have leaders this year. I said, yes, we do. They're just different than last year. You, could, you have to lead within your personality. And, you know, we could challenge people. But you could also like we our leadership team at Alabama this year was different than last year. And at first they thought they weren't leaders because they weren't uh, abrasive. You have to be abrasive. Hey, 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 Michael, I believe in you. I want you to believe in you. I, um, I think what you do is you have a great vision. Now let you and I keep talking about the process and let's talk about how we can work through it, how you can, how you could take your mind and learn how to think through these things. Let's look about where your sticking points are. I don't need to shame you, but let's change your behavior. Connect with them first, Tim, just a real good connection. And then just point out, can we just keep on talking about the process? And I'm gonna get you into something when you come here called nitty gritty goals and accountability where they lay out their daily goals and they keep each other accountable, that's gonna take them to the top. When you add that to the remarkable stuff you're doing, but it really is, I'm gonna lay out my daily agenda and get people around me to keep me accountable to doing it. That's what's behind all the championships. That's what you do. So, and then you, you push ownership to them, mm -hmm. ownership off to them. So I, what I would do for those guys is say, lay out your daily schedule, day out, I talk about plotting, lay it out and help other people keep you accountable to it, you're gonna to go to the top. We'll, we'll, we'll get Tim into nitty gritty goals here and putting your guys in teams and getting that done. You'll like it. Well, yeah. Dr. Elf, I wanna thank you. There's never been a time that I've been with you that I, that I wasn't in a better position after spending time with you. Uh, if you guys don't know, Dr. Elko and I did an event together last year. He talked a lot about connection. I came home and as a result of that, I was a better dad, I was a better husband, I was a better leader. Okay, the power of connection that we'll get into and how important that is. So what you're really getting in July, man, is a lifetime of work of Dr. Elko breaking down and studying the, the most current research. That's why I always love working with him. He studied the most current research and all the good stuff. Uh, and there's nobody in the world better than him. So you're going to get both of us in July. 
Sign up tonight, 97 bucks, folks. We're trying to get three to 500 people on there. We believe that we can help a lot of people and, and deliver years and years and decades of coaching experience to help you really perform at a higher level. So tonight was worth 97 bucks to me, Dr. Elko. So checks in the mail to you, big guy. So thank you for, for being who you are. Guys, thank you guys for showing up and we'll see you in July. Let's get you signed up, man. Get Take action tonight, man. Don't put this off. Get your team signed up on this. It's going to be an incredible July. So thank you guys. Have a great night. God bless you.